You're listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast that features interviews with thriller, mystery, and suspense authors. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash M-T-T-A. And that's an M as in murder. Over 180,000 titles, including great thrillers to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So stay tuned for the next episode of Meet the Thriller Author. everybody. Welcome to Meet the uh, Thriller Author. I'm your host, Alan Peterson, and I'm going to be uh, talking with uh, author John Mills uh, today. Uh, he writes uh, very uh, exciting, uh, fast action uh, thrillers, uh, so it's a pleasure to have him on the uh, podcast. Uh, John, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Can you tell us, uh, the listeners a little bit about yourself, your, your background, and a little bit about your books? Yeah, so I'm originally from uh, the south of England, but uh, I live in Ontario, uh, Canada now. Um, I've been here, what, 20, it's got to be about 20 years now. I spent around about 14 of those years uh, in the advertising world before I become a full-time author. I've been writing since around about January uh, 2011. That's when I kind of got started in it. I mean, I was writing before then, but that's kind of when I started to publish and that. Um, since then, I've written about 42 novels, uh, 29 short stories. Uh, I mean, a lot of those are under different pen names. Um, 11 of those novels are under my name, and six of those are what make up the Debt Collector series, or otherwise known as uh, Jack Winchester Thriller series. Wow, 42 novels. That's incredible. That's, uh, we'll, have to get, yeah. we'll have to get into that in a little bit about exactly your, your, your writing sure. process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about Jack Winchester and the Debt Collector series? Yeah, like the, the book itself, it's, it's mainly focused on uh, an ex-mafia hitman who's basically known nothing else but like the mob life. And uh, after he ends up in, he does a stint in, in uh, jail, he comes out and he wants to kind of leave it all behind him and kind of turn over a fresh leaf, so to speak. Uh, and so over the course of the series, um, he's basically looking to make amends kind of for the wrong in his life by helping others. And obviously, you know, that's not as easy as it ends up being. But, uh, yeah, so that's that's mainly what the, the bulk of it is. There's six uh, books in this series so far. Um, the first uh, novel picks up when he gets out of jail and he kind of w- wants to walk away from it all, but he, uh, he's, he realizes it's not an easy task. You don't just walk out of the mafia after you've been in for years killing people and so forth. Um, so he ends up coming to an agreement, or at least you know somewhat an agreement, where he's going to take on one last job and uh, he ends up going to a, a small town in Maine somewhat to clean up the mess that landed him in prison. And so he goes there to uh, deal with a guy and find some money. But when he gets there, the guy's missing and so is the money. And so it kind of it really deals with kind of actions and consequences and trying to adjust to a life, be, you know, beyond all that you've ever known um, and learning to trust others in the process when your entire life you always kind of kept people at a, an arm's length. Yeah, that sounds like a fascinating series, and your your books are selling uh, uh, very well. Uh, how has been the uh, the feedback and the reader responses? Has, uh, has it been exciting? Yeah, I mean, initially, when I first put out um, The Debt Collector, I never saw it as a series. I, I was going to do a... I was going to do this first book, and it was going to be focused on the on, on the town called Rockland Cove. And I was every uh, if I did end up doing other books after that, it was going to be you know a new character appearing in Rockland Cove. And uh, initially, it was just going to be him. But once I got to the end of it, I kind of had a feeling that I wasn't kind of done with that character. I kind of would you know was kind of interested as to where it would go next. You know, what would be the response of the the, the mafia and um, And, you know, basically what the consequences of when you try to help somebody. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, when I first put out that book, it was one of those ones where I put it out and it did all right initially. But then it kind of, you know, there was crickets and I'm thinking, God, what's going on here? And, you know, like a lot of other authors, you'll put out a book and sometimes it doesn't initially take off. And so you, you either think, well, that's 
maybe not kind of, you know, one to follow on with. And so you move on. And so that's kind of what I did. I moved on to something else. And then I kept this, he, the character was still in my head. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to write another one in this, in this series. Uh, but this time what I'll do is I'll put the first one free and I'll put the second one out. And that's when I started to see a shift. So I saw people started downloading, obviously, the first one. And then they went on to buy the second. And I started to, you know, see quite an increase there. So I said, okay, I'll write the third one. And then from there, it's just continued on. I just keep writing, you know, another one in that series. And as long as I have a, a story in mind and a strong story, because that's what I try to do. Because it's been a progression the way he's come out. He initially didn't come out and think, okay, I'm going to help people. He just wanted to get away from the mafia, you know, and just get away from that lifestyle. Um, but over the course of the books, that's kind of he's transitioned into that. Yeah, that's great. And the reviews have been have been fantastic. I was just going to look at them now. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. That's exciting. And to think that you were like almost thinking about maybe not continuing on the series, but uh, it was kind of you, it, the character wouldn't let let you go. That's, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and I think as well. I mean, you know, with any author, people always want. I mean, most people have the authors that they like in mind. You know, so they already know that there's certain authors that they like, and so jumping onto some you know jumping on to a new stories or a new uh, series with a with an author that they're not familiar with yeah it can be a bit daunting and that and so i think that's where that free book comes in handy and now i don't use that with other series that i have you know i mean i've other times i'll just go in at 99 cents and it just does well for a few days and then i put it to 2.99 and, and it's fine but you know depending on what book you or series that you're writing yeah you it may work to test, you know, the waters at free, uh, to put the first one free. Is the first one still free on, on Amazon? Yeah. No. Yeah. And for as, for as far as I know, I, I'll leave it, you know, leave the first one free because it just keeps bringing people in. I give it away as well on my, uh, through my site. So Yeah, I noticed that on your website. If people want to check it out, uh, you're giving them a couple of books for free uh, for, for joining your, uh, your, your newsletter. Yeah, the um, the other one is the Undisclosed uh, Trilogy. That was originally my very f first book that I kind of published and I put out there. And, you know, like a lot of authors, you put out the first book and you think it's going to be a runaway success. And then, you know, you hear crickets and you think, dear me, what the heck's going on here, you know? Um, but, you know, it's done all right. It's just it's it's a different audience. It's, you know, cases to kind of the, uh, the young kind of audience, the uh, YA audience and you know, as we know, a lot of them are not the ones who are usually buying books. It's a lot of people kind of, at least from what I can tell. I mean, I, I tend to find that there's a lot of more people over the age of, say, 25 or 30 that are that are buying books. And, uh, yeah, so it's, the, yeah, I give away that one. It's still a good series. It's a good series. And I, that, that actually, that first book took me about six or seven months to write you know, which is a long way from where I am now, where I, I usually put out about a, a book a month. I aim to to put out a book a month. Anything above that is is a bonus. It's usually slightly above that because I write under different pen names. And so I have to keep kind of feeding, you know, both my main name, which is John, and then obviously, you know, other pen names as well. So is your, the other books you write in the other pen names, uh, do, are they in the same genres or do they vary? Like you have yeah. adult and... Like I've mentioned the one on my, my Facebook um, page there, the Jack Hunt, yeah. you know, I, I put that out mainly just because uh, it's kind of it's somewhat similar in, in the sense that it does provide a, a thriller like State of Panic and The Renegades and there's a, um, there's a uh, time travel one and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's post-apocalyptic and that. Oh, um, but yeah, other the other genres that I'm in, you know, mystery genres, and uh, I've even dabbled in the romance genre. It's, uh, you know, I, I and the reason I do that and I keep it separate as well is just yeah, because a lot of people don't, you know, people who like thriller books just tend to like those. They don't like pretty much, you know, other books. And whereas I'm, I'm all over the place. I love, <laughs> you know, I love diving into different things, and I get I get bored really easily, you know, with writing. I mean, I, I love, love writing about the debt collector and Jack Winchester, but if I just did that only, oh yeah, I mean, I would just it would just drive me nuts because you know I like to jump into to other areas and go into you know write different books and that. So, 
Wow, and that's uh, your Jack Hunt series is doing. I just, I'm just taking a peek here. It's doing really well as well. So, how do you manage the, the, all these different pen names? Is it a, a challenge or? Um, somewhat like I mean, I don't set up um, you know Facebook pages for them and that. Um, only a few of them have websites. Some of them don't. They just literally have a, an email sign up, and I mean, they all. Res- People respond differently in different audiences, I find, as well, which is another thing, you know, you, you learn, you think, oh, you know, in some audiences, the response is, it can be really harsh, and in some audiences, it's really, people are good, you know, in, in, in regards to reviews and stuff, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I just try to, my only challenge is making sure that I'm continuing to write, you know, a new book for that that pen name, and so, my focus usually is the John Mills and the Jack Hunt, but I'm also uh, putting out other ones under my other pen names. And so those ones might come every two or three months, you know, whereas these ones generally I'll flip back and forward between them. So you write one at a time, like you'll write a Jack Hunt and then you'll write a, a John Mills or do you like go back yeah. and forth? Yeah, uh, no, I, uh, I'll i write, um, like, this month, I was uh, writing under three, so my main name, and then two other pen names, and so it's very rare that I do that, like, do three at the time, you know, be writing what, three books at the same time, like, so I'll begin my, I'll begin the day writing, you know, several thousand on one, and then I'll jump to the next one, then I'll jump to the to the next one. Usually, I just focus on, on two, and the, again, another reason for that is because I get, I get, I get bored real quick, even though the book doesn't, I mean, it sounds like, okay, then the book isn't going to be good, but what I mean is I just, I like to jump around, you know, I Mm -hmm. like to kind of be stretched in in my writing and that, and so, yeah, I find I tend to write in in two different series at a time, and the only time that that's an issue is if, if, if one is in first person and the second one is in third person. Because I sometimes can suddenly, do you know what I mean? You can yeah. start to get a bit mixed up, but uh, that always get that always gets sorted out. It's usually maybe a chapter or something like that, and then I, I correct it later. But so, what's your writing process? Do you like have like do you outline all these uh, stories and before you write them? The way I've always approached, it, even before I started writing full time, was to just kind of treat it, you know, like a job. I mean, um, I I say that I. I was writing full time before I got paid full time. That's that's how I've always approached it. Um, you know, I start every day. I write every day. There isn't a day that I generally don't write unless I'm editing a book. So like at the end of a book, I'll go be go through it and that before I hand it to my editor. And that usually, I find it hard to write and edit. You know, to write a new one and then edit the one that I just finished. And so I just tend to kind of, I'll get the editing out of the way and then I'll jump back in. But yeah, I usually, you know, I, I aim for anywhere from five, my minimum is about 5,000 words a day. And I try to go for about seven and a half thousand as my goal. But and so what I usually do is the morning, so between nine and 12, I try to get around about two and a half to 3,000 words done then. And then the afternoon is spent aiming for the 5,000. And so on another book, um, <clears throat> and I just keep going. And so, so I might get done by five. I might get done by six. Those are the good day, uh, days when you get done at that time. But otherwise, I might find it stretches over to six or seven o'clock, you know. And, um, but I, I always try to at least get the minimum of that 5,000. You know, some people say, well, why bother doing that? You know, why don't just do 2,000 and then uh, and put out maybe two books a year? But you can do that if you've got a bit of a runaway success, mm-hmm. you know, if you've got, if you were like, say the guy who wrote the Martian, <laughs> you know, he's selling books, you know, so many books that, yeah, he's, he can, he can sit back and go, okay, I'll write another one next year. But when you're not in that position, yeah, you've got to be, you know, be fairly proficient and, um, giving people what they want so they don't forget about you as well you know because there's so many books uh being published at the moment so and five thousand words really i mean if you sit down and you've got the whole day it's it's not a huge amount uh to be writing if even if you're doing only say a thousand words an hour that's five hours and you know if you're doing most jobs are an eight an eight hour day so um it's not a far stretch to think that that can uh can be done so yeah that's a great way to look at it and other authors that i've interviewed say the same thing that they look at it as as it's my job you know it's a job that i love and so you know like everyone else goes to a job for like you said eight hours nine hours ten hours and 
it's a good, at, good, good attitude, good way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, there's some days I sit down and I look at the screen and I just think, oh, you know, I really don't want to do this today. But then again, you in any every job, you have those days where you're like, I don't want to do this. But if you if you get into a pattern of, you know, oh, today I'm going to only write for an hour, or, or today I'm going to just go and do something else, it, that pattern will soon become a habit and before you know it you'll be three months down the road and you'll be looking back and going oh i wish i'd done xyz you know Mm -hmm. so when i set out to go full time because initially what i was doing was i was doing advertising so i was working for myself anyway so i was able to play around with my hours a bit but yeah i mean i just set out to say you know what i want to go full time what does that look like if i'd gone on forums and listened to what some people said you know well right you know take your time write that book you know one book or two books a year and that's it yeah i wouldn't have gone full time there's no way so i i went out like a bat out of hell and said you know what i need to get x amount of words done in a day and um i approached it like that and so when i write i write and i don't edit when i write so i just plow all the way through and get all the words done and then get all and get that first draft which i you know, call my vomit draft because it literally is. You're just getting out the story, you know, the nuts and bolts of the story. It doesn't look pretty um, at the end, but that's where you, when you go over the second time, you know, you can start to take pieces out, add in more description and kind of hone it and make it what it is, the final result, you know. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, mainly like that's what I kind of, that's how I approach it for outlining and stuff like that. Initially, I used to really outline a lot, like heavily outline. I would spend a month outlining a book, but I realized by the time I got to sit uh, to sit down and write it, I was bored. You know what I mean? I, that that initial spark that I had of that excitement to kind of get out a story was gone. It was just lost, and I was just like, "Oh, this is I'm going through the motions now." Um, so I do believe in outlining. Um, and I, I still do that and I kind of break it down into kind of a four act structure and I just hit the main beats, you know, this has got to happen, this has got to happen. And there, But there's other books I don't. I just literally sit down, I know what I'm going to do, like if it's a mystery, I know somebody's going to die, they're going to get interviewed, they're going to find out the clues and then they're going to, you know, reveal who the killer is. And what do you use to write? Do you use like a, a writing software or like Word? Or just Word? Yeah, just just straight up Microsoft Word. I have Scrivener, but you know what? I just couldn't be bothered to sit there. And uh, I know a number of people um, use uh, Naturally Speaking Dragon or whatever it's called. Yeah, mm-hmm. I try. I try to do that, but um, I literally had to speak like John Wayne to <laughs> understand me. It's, it's something. I know you. You're meant to train it, but yeah, I, I was. I really, really couldn't understand what I was saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, screw this! And I just, I just threw that to one side. And you know, I, I write fairly fast, and uh, so that, you know. Well, yeah, it's that, it's the, yeah, your your process is definitely working for you. So you don't need yeah. any of that, <laughs> that other stuff. And uh, do you, so you must have a really good team in place, like an editor and a book cover designer, so like everything can so you can generate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the way I look at it, and this is literally how I look at it, is if if I'm writing, say, a book that's fifty five thousand words, I know, and I'm writing, say, five thousand a day, I'm going to have that done in about twelve days if I if I stay on track. It's very the only times I I veer off track is if I get a, a headache, you know, if I get ill. Or, but generally, I mean, if I don't get what I need to get done in the day, like say I have to go and run errands, I would try and make that up in the evening. I don't just slack off and go, okay, um, I'm going to sit here and just watch Netflix all the time. Because, you know, if you, you know, if you if you've been busy in the day and you've had to go off and do do stuff, I have to get up to speed and make sure I get that, that word count done. Um, so yeah, I have a good editor. She is really good. Um, she captures a lot of the British lingo that I'm just, uh, that tends to, I mean, I've been living in Canada 20 years, so I've, I kind of familiar now with, you know, American terms and stuff like that, but occasionally things slip in and she'll catch those. She, she, um, turns around a book pretty fast, like anywhere from three to four days, uh, so, you know, if you're looking at, say, 12 days, you get a book done, three or four days, you hand it 
to an editor, it comes back. I then go through it again, uh, try to catch those last, any few things that weren't seen, and then maybe have one other person go look through it. And then I get it out there, you know. I Because um, the thing is, and this is, you can overanalyze it and get really, like I did with my first book, you know, spend seven months writing, then sit there spending another month, a month or two looking over and out thinking, oh, this is crap, you know, like, I might have to rewrite this whole thing. Um, and then hand it to the editor and then hand it to 15 proofreaders. But you can guarantee it will still end up out there and somebody is going to find an error and rake you over the coals for it. And you're going to have people who are going to say, you know what, this was crap, you know, it's, because, you know, you're going to have people who say this is great, and you're going to have people who say, oh, I, you know, I want to burn this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you're definitely not going to please everybody. <laughs> yeah, it just is the way it is. You're going to have those, and they're entitled to their opinion, yeah. you know. But uh, if I ever catch them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go ring on the doorbell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was that uh, movie that just silent, what is it, Jay? I can't remember the name of it, but they were, at the end of the movie, they were ringing all the doorbell of the people who wrote bad reviews, and they're like beating them up. It was kind of funny, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, do you? Um, uh, is, that's something that's so so fascinating. Do you, so you don't have like a, a beta readers and all that stuff because I mean, you need to be really efficient. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm probably going to people are going to go, well, I'm going to read his and I'm going to find all the errors now. But <laughs> no, I think the more you write, the the, the more you and you work with an editor, the more you start to find those mistakes, you correct your own mistakes mm -hmm. to some degree. Uh, I still work with the editor. She is very good at what she does, and she catches some a lot of what I do. So I, once I finish the book, I read through it. I fill out, you know, descriptions, and I find those glaring errors. And I, I usually put it into a different format, and I recommend that to anybody. And that kind of goes back to when I used to do advertising for people. You know, I'd finish writing a piece for somebody and then I would put it into PDF or EPUB and read it in that format because there's something about seeing it in a different format helps you see those errors. The you... Anyway, so I'll go through it, then I'll hand it to my editor, she goes through it, comes back to me, then I'll go through it again and uh, and then as I say, I might hand it to one more person but beyond that, yeah, I don't have a whole ton of people, I just don't, if I did that, I'd be so behind, it's just like, move on it's and then so far it's working the process is working for me and i have a guy who does my uh covers um yeah he does my covers the only ones i didn't get him to do was the state of panic ones which was quite interesting because when i did those i'm very i don't usually do my own covers because you know as you as you know it, it can end up looking pretty bad <laughs> But when I did the State of Panic, I kind of had a rough idea of what I wanted it to look like. And so when I put that out, three or four days later, I'm thinking, oh, this book isn't picking up steam, you know. And then it suddenly started. To, and so I went back to my guy. I said, can you make me covers? And he's all right, I'll go ahead and do it. As he's making the covers, the book starts picking up. And then it really starts taking off. And so and then I'm like, well... Oh, all right, I'm just going to stick to the covers. And so that's what I did. And so the covers he made for me, I'm now going to use um, in a new series that I'm releasing uh, in December. Um, you know, and it's in the post-apocalyptic. So, uh, so but yeah, so that goes to show you is, you know, these people that say you always get people to do your covers. You know what? It depends. I mean, you, yeah, yeah you, I mean, you, you might hit a home run. You might not. <laughs> Yeah, so you did those the state of panic covers the the first you did those yourself the, the yeah I did, yeah I did those myself wow and, uh, like, my my goal was crazy. just to have something that was simple and uh, that had you know some blood splatter on there yeah and and that was it and it, and it stands out on Amazon and uh, yeah, yeah that's kind of what I did. but the other ones yeah I, I had the guy who, uh, my cover artist do those do yeah. those so. Yeah, well, no, you, you, yeah, you're, you're, the ones you do yourself are good. You, they don't look at all like uh, like you said. Some, sometimes when yeah. the authors do them themselves, they, they shouldn't be doing them, but you, you yeah, look good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, generally, rule of thumb is I would say most people get somebody else to yeah. do them. Yeah, like but, me. You know, <laughs> you're a bit mad occasionally, and you kind of, then, yeah, maybe give it a go yourself. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm glad I, that's why I asked you about the beta readers. I'm so, I'm, I'm, 
I'm excited to hear you say that because I've decided to cut them out. And if, yeah. I, if my beta readers are listening, I really appreciate them helping me for, you know, I mean, they're helping me for free. But I got overwhelmed because then I would have like five Word docs with oh, you know, yeah. comments and messages. And it was just, it was just, yeah. So now I'm just, I'll never give up my editor and proofreader, but uh, I'm, I'm not using beta readers anymore. Yeah. So and there's a lot of people, yeah, I know there's a lot of people that are, uh, you know, that have this big arc team in place mm-hmm. and that, you know, and I, I mean, I have people who are available for that, but I really haven't used that. And a lot of people say, well, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're not getting those reviews straight out of the gate. But what, from what I've seen, because Amazon is, you know, clamping down on those folks, a lot of folks who are putting out a book and then one day after suddenly they've got, you know, a hundred reviews sitting there. And uh, whilst that somewhat looks good, I've noticed I don't know what it is. Maybe, I mean, maybe I'm wrong in this. It's just kind of what I've noticed that sometimes not having as many reviews gets people to look at your book just because they think, oh, this is new. Whereas they might see a book with a lot of reviews and think it's been out there a while. And, Hmm. or maybe that, you know, you've just got your friends and, you know, mother or whatever to, to put, you know, the reviews or something. So I, you know, I just, I I write the book and I think as long as it's a good story, you eventually will get the reviews over, you know, the the next five days, they'll start to roll in and they'll start to build up. And as long as you're asking for the review, you know, at the end, you know, if you like the book, you know, consider leaving a review, you know, most people do. And, you know, that's how I go about it anyway, but each to their own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, whatever works for 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 people. Yeah. But yeah, I think uh, I, I, yeah, who knows what Amazon do, does also with their algorithms? You know, they might yeah. you know if you get too many at once. Who know? I mean, I don't know. That's all speculation. Only only the Amazon engineers can confirm that <laughs> or deny it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you have like a? Do you use your mailing list? Do you have a a, a good loyal mailing list uh, to work with? Yeah, yeah, and I, that's one thing I would agree with most other authors on is that you know building that mailing list. Um, is ideal i mean there's a lot of people that that will uh give away things you know and stuff like that for free you know to get build that mailing list but and maybe that works and such well it does it works in getting people if you give away anything for free everybody shows up but <laughs> you know not necessarily does that mean that somebody's going to open your email i mean going back to my advertising days i used to help people with trying to increase their the response from their emails you know and uh One of the biggest things is I would say to people is, you know, sending an email out to somebody unless they're, you know, people are so busy. They've got so many distractions. It's like asking somebody to to do 10 jumping jacks in the middle of their day. You know, a lot of the time, unless they're really interested in your books, um, you know, it's, it's an it's an intrusion on their day to some extent and people will argue and say it's not, but I, I, you know, I get, I get so many emails come through. There's only so many that you can open in a day. So, so yeah, I, most of the time, you know, if you're giving away free stuff, you, you're going to gain a nice big list, but whether or not they open and whether or not they click and whether or not they buy are, you know, is, is something that everybody's aiming for. Everybody's trying to go for, but, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like- yeah, yeah. A list of, uh, of of readers, a small list of of readers who bought your book and signed up because they liked your book is going to be a lot more valuable than a, book, oh, yeah, than yeah. a big list of of people who just signed up because it's free. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. Funny. And I think as well, you for every you know say hundred readers you get to sign up, maybe only fifty of those realistically are going to. Um, are going to open your emails. I don't know why that is. It's just that, I mean, just in the advertising world, people know that for every X amount of readers, you're only going to get a certain percentage that are going to open up. Now they'll say, you know, there's, there's tricks to kind of, uh, you know, to encourage people to open up, you know, better head, uh, better subject lines and, uh, better first, uh, you know, the first line of your email and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately the other thing is, is delivery, you know, uh, delivering of emails not all those a lot of emails sometimes just end up in people's spam boxes or if they've signed up using their facebook uh through facebook that facebook email email may not be their main email mm. uh i know the one i have isn't it's not my main email so if i use that to sign up yeah i wouldn't see it i just because i never checked that email yeah, and I'm I'm one of those who have who have I have a separate email for newsletters too that I check maybe a couple times 
a month versus my re- main email address. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, the same with with uh, you know the same with uh, pen names and with forum uh, online. I mean, it's just because there's so many places you can end up getting spammed. It's just I, I guard my main email, the one yeah that we we communicated on. I guard that with my life. That mm-hmm. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny. Otherwise, you just, yeah, you just never find the emails that you need to see. Yeah. <laughs> So when you started writing, uh, were you a fan of the thrillers as a reader before you started writing them? You know, I the when you know for, for me, I mean, yeah, I like I like thrillers. Um, again, I have, my approach has always just been as a writer. Like I, enjoy, I just enjoy stories. So as long as it's got like a good character in it and it's full of action, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pick it up. I mean, I don't read a, a ton of uh, thriller books. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I grew up on when I was a kid was kind of like Enid Blyton and Roald Dahl and C.S. Lewis, uh, J.R. Tolkien, uh, S- Stephen King, that type of stuff. The more adventure style books, you know, um, where people, are, where groups of people are put in situations. And uh, I guess that's why. I write, you know, occasionally about groups, you know, groups of people, just because I like that. I like uh, the different variety of, um, you know, characters that you can have and the way that they respond and that. But, uh, yeah, I kind of, you know, I like anything that kind of just keeps me interested. I mean, I think it's the same with anybody else, you know. If it makes you fall asleep after a couple of chapters, then I I put it to one side. All these uh, stories that you're writing, uh, do the ideas come to you like uh, like quickly, and do you like jot them down, or how, how do you how do you manage the the ideas for your stories? Yeah, like I think the same with most people. I mean, my stories kind of will come from like an idea. So, for instance, for the debt collector, I'd actually watched a documentary about um, somebody who was in the mafia and he killed for a living. That's all he did, and he was on. He was it was a prison interview. And, you know, they asked him, do you regret any of the murders that you did? And he's like, no, I don't regret them. I feel nothing, you know. But he was married all the time. You know, his wife didn't. I don't think his wife even fully knew what he did. Uh, or if she did, then uh, she didn't ask. Uh, the, the only regret that he had was in regards to his, his wife and his kids and what pain it may have caused them. But he didn't regret it. But the thing was, the question that came was, if you could have done... If you could have avoided this lifestyle, would you? And he said yes. And that was the the spark for the debt collector. I thought, what would that look like? You know, if somebody, because let's face it, we're a product of our environment. You know, we we are uh, a product of our parents, the country we live in, the people that we surround ourselves with. And if all you've ever known is the mob uh, and the mafia life. How do you walk away from that? Your whole mindset, the way your actions, the way you view people is from a very uh, a specific type of uh, way of looking at life. And so, yeah, I was intrigued by that. And I thought, well, what does that look like? If you could walk away from the mob, what would that look like? And that's, so that was, that was the spark for the debt collector for, uh, for State of Panic. That one came because uh, I was looking at, you know, different post-apocalyptic you know scenarios that could happen and i began looking at the nuclear one um and i thought well that you know i started well who would you know who would attack america and so forth and that and then i started looking at russia and then i looked at what the cold war uh, what was happening in the cold war and i come across an article about these nuke bombs in suitcases and how there was like 84 of these that went missing um and the FBI is still looking for them, and they think that they ended up on the black market, but they don't know whose hands they could have ended up in. And so, you know, I thought, well, who could those have ended up in? And so I, at first I thought, you know, regular terrorists. But then I thought, well, you know, that might hit a bit too close to home because a lot of, you know, obviously a lot of terror attacks and that. And so I started looking at the, you know, white supremacist group. Now, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, people out there will say, well, they're, they're not very large, but, you know, they're, they're out there. They're just not, you know, and they're not on the news all the time, and they maybe not, you know, you don't bump into them all the time and that, but they're out there. And so I thought it would be interesting to kind of play with that story of having it end up in their hands, you know. And, uh, you know, I took some liberties with the number of people, the number of um, white supremacists that ended up in that town. Now, they came there for a rally. Uh, you know, but I've had people say, oh, well, you know, there wouldn't be that many. Well, 
it was there they were there for a rally a hundred people or two or three hundred people showing up isn't much if you look at some of the rallies that have been held mm -hmm. and so i mean and ultimately at the end of the day i think you know we kind of take liberties yes i try to make it as as believable as possible but we're in the entertainment business you know and if you look at hollywood they are constantly taking liberties you know i, I think it was <clears throat> somebody approached mel gibson after he did that one movie it was called uh it was about uh, that culture down, I forget what the name of it was. It was down in South America. Or oh, yeah, Apocalyptus or something. That's it. Apocalypse, and they, yeah. they approached him and said, hey, you know what, this isn't accurate. And he said, you know what, if you want accurate, go watch a, a documentary or buy yeah. read a biography. You know, we're in the entertainment business. And so, yeah, you know, you try to make it as entertaining as you, uh, as accurate as you can. But, you know, if you made. And I think this is why Hollywood takes liberties is because if you made it um, as believable as possible, a lot of the stories that would be that were told would be as boring as hell. Yeah, it's fiction. So, you know, <laughs> exactly. I mean, police work, you know, is is ninety percent paperwork. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's uh, somebody once said to me, it's it's hours of boredom and and seconds of sheer terror. So it's that's the reality of it yet obviously in hollywood and in books you you want to you want to give people a good time and so yeah you take liberties and sometimes you know you still get those people who show up and they're looking for you know you to be completely accurate but you know well i, I try to use that to my benefit and go away and then the next time write something as accurate as i can but at the same time i still take liberties out uh, here to hell with it yeah. <laughs> and do you do, do you put in a lot of research you can get lost in research. Yes. You know, it's, that's the part I think a lot of authors enjoy, at least I do. I love looking into it, and I could sit there for hours browsing online and picking up the phone and, you know, contact like a police station down in, 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 in a place to find out information. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people won't even notice that research. You know what I mean? So it's like you, you think you've put in something that's really kind of believable, and nobody notices that. They don't really realize that that is quite believable. But um, so I, I put in research, you know, as, as I say, say for the for the, you know, the debt collector. I looked at the mafia, uh, the mafia. I looked at kind of some of the ways that they killed people. And, um, you know, I looked at the area that he was going to be in, the town itself and uh, and some of the procedures that the police would take and that, uh, you know, but I, I don't I try not to get too too into it i write down some of the main points and I, I ask myself what do i need to know you know to get this story out what is the most important and uh that's that's how i approach research so yeah I, i'll jump online or pick up the phone which so uh, what are you writing now well i wrapped up one of the debt collector books and the next series that i'll write under the, under my main name will be a, a cia thriller and so it'll be kind of like an ex-military guy um, and it'll be kind of CIA based. Um, the ones that I'm wrapping up at the moment are under the uh, the Jack Hunt. There'll be two books that will come out under that in in December. That will be a, one will be a sci-fi uh, that's set in space, like a military sci-fi, and the other is a post-apocalyptic. And it will use the covers that I originally should have used for my State of Panic books. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> You're not wasting any resources. That's smart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, and I try to stretch myself as I can, you know, like um, jump in, jumping into different genres is a little bit tricky because you can do it and it doesn't work. But then, you know, just because it doesn't work the first time doesn't mean it won't on your next book. And do you like, spend a lot of time like, uh, are you like, do you have a big presence on Facebook and, and Twitter and all that stuff? Or are you just focusing on reading and, put, and getting books out to your readers? Yeah, like, I mean, I don't go through a lot of, you know, sending out a lot of them. And my Twitter is mainly used for kind of, you know, things that I come across that I find interesting in my own personal interests, really, more more than my books. Uh, occasionally, I'll put my books on there, you know, like, you know, say this book's just come out. The Facebook is mainly just for my books. Uh, at one time, I did have it as, you know, I used it for other things. But, yeah, mainly now it's just for books and uh um, yeah, as well, I think most of us know as well with Facebook, it only reaches so many people, at least, you know, when you put out a post, you can have a lot of people that are, that are following you or have liked your page, but not a lot of them are going to see it because they're trying to push to get you to use their advertising. Yeah. Which is just a, 
just makes sense, doesn't it, from from the point of view of them. Yeah, that's why Mark Zuckerberg is a, a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not going to take uh, too much more of your time here, John. And, and just for, so people, and I'll have links to your website and stuff on the website, but uh, your your John Mills site is johnmills.com, and that's John, J-O-N. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah johnmills.com, and then the Facebook is, I think it's the author, John Mills. And uh, Twitter is just John Mills as well, yeah. Okay, I'd like to encourage the listeners to go there because yeah, you can get a couple of John's books there and you can check them out. And, well, also on Amazon, the Duck Collector. But yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome that you you get let people to, to check out your, your books for free. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always handy in that. Yeah, I appreciate anybody who reads it and they, if they find it entertaining, you know, I appreciate my readers and, uh, you know, anyone who hasn't tried it, give it a go and see it, see how you like the uh, the books. But, uh, you know, anybody who's trying, you know, is like an author as well, is trying to kind of get to that next stage, you know, I would just, I would rec- just encourage them, you know, just say, you know, what if, just kind of pursue it like an obsession almost, you know, and uh, just try and write full time, even if you're not right, even if you're not getting paid full time, approach it that way. And eventually it, it, you'll get to that point. It will happen, but you know you, you're going to have some ups and downs along the way. And I'm still, you know, say I'm in, I'm in the same boat. I still, still run into the moments where you put something out and you, you hear crickets, and then other times where it takes off and you're not really too sure why it took off. Yep. So the key really is to just keep writing and publishing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah right. A, yeah. All right, John. Well, thank you for uh, being on the uh, podcast, and uh, it was nice chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Meet the Thriller Author. I'd like to ask you to please review and rate this uh, podcast over on iTunes. It really helps me get the word out. If you take a few seconds of your time to uh, do that, it would be much appreciated. You can also visit my website at thrillingreads.com forward slash podcast for show notes on this episode, as well as information about the uh, podcast in general. And you can also sign up for my mailing list there. You'll be getting uh, special offers from our guests, as well as information, uh, behind the scenes information on the podcast. And uh, please do visit my author website at alanpeterson.com. I appreciate your support. And so until next episode, I will talk to you then.